Good afternoon, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. As a museum person, I have always been fascinated by the promptness of um, art and culture festivals, biennials, art spaces, fairs, because they could relate to current political and social phenomena, bringing numerous artists, curators, and activists to express in most creative ways their opinions, provoke discussion, and inspire. They had, in my view, the freedom to host political discourse in real time, unlike the museums, which usually take years to realize any such project. But now I ask myself, is that still so? Are museums still stalemated by their past practice? Are the alternative spaces more impactful, really? Gladly, I can say there is change, there has been change, and I have been witness to the progress of this change. Almost three decades after Stephen E. Wiles' article, Rethinking the Museum, an Emerging New Paradigm, appeared in the journal Museum News, and a decade and a half after that, uh, it appeared or reappeared in the book Reinventing the Museum, Historical and Contemporary Perspectives on the Paradigm Shift, edited by Gail Anderson, I noticed the phrase paradigm shift became one of the most pronounced, or shall I say, ticked keywords in speeches and in writings about contemporary cases pertaining to museums and the museum profession lately. One thing is for sure, museums are now more aware that they can be agents of social change and catalysts of mutual understanding and social cohesion. They can and need to get involved with their communities, understand how cultural tradition, sorry, understand how cultural communities and policymakers help develop cultural tradition and identities on a local, national, or regional scale and be part of the daily life. Migrants' distress, or Trump's rise, or violence on the streets anywhere in the, in the world, gun control, the rise of nationalism in, Europe, in European countries, the vote on Brexit, or geriatric issues, Me Too movement, or climate change have never been so present in our lives, thanks also to the digital technologies and social media. It seems our lives have not ever been so immediately and intensely touched by developments in our own community or other communities as they are today. So the question is, how can museums keep being relevant if they do not touch lives? Museums are considered among the most trusted and revered institutions in the world. This is an advantageous start. Let's see what we do with it and what more can be done. We are known for delivering non-biased information through our exhibitions and learning programs. Do we provide multiple perspectives on the past and on present developments? Whose stories do we tell? Do we build platforms, forums that invite people to tell and hear these stories, to discuss and get motivated to collaborate for a better tomorrow? Museums, through plural stories, can assist locally and globally, bridging societies divided by social fault lines and creating harmony. They collaborate and contribute to the democratization of society. It is, of course, not so simple or easy, although I'd much like it to be thinking of the geography I come from. There are histories for identities that are neglected or overlooked in museums because of political circumstances or non-official histories. The dominant discourse can exclude groups on a national scale or an international, supranational scale, as for example, the position of others within European identities and heritages and exclusion of some minorities from a stronger inclusion into European society. The past can be quite effective in creating a sense of belonging or non-belonging within smaller communities or within countries. 
this is as well a matter of cultural policy, domestic and or international. In fact, there has been a deep affiliation between museums and the status quo. At least actively sustaining the status quo or not actively criticizing it, leave alone protesting, has been perceived as a neutral stance, not politicized. Just the opposite would be true for any social or institutional criticism that would be perceived as politicization. This is not a phenomenon of the far past. The events around the dismantling of the Confederate statues in the southern states of the US took place only a year or two ago. The past cannot be changed, but it can be faced and righted, rectified, and repaired. In 2017, the International Council of Museums, ICOM, had as its International Museum Day theme, Museums and Contested Histories, saying the unspeakable in museums. This was an occasion for museum professionals to focus on darker pages of the past and the present, on discussing post-trauma action in societies and reconciliation, but also inquiring if action could be taken while undesired acts are in the making this very day or even before they started. Yes, for instance, there was the slavery of the past and it had to be faced, but the contemporary slavery of the domestic worker, for example, could not be ignored either. So I ask myself and you, do museums get a better opportunity than this to establish international collaborations, bring such diverse and plural communities together and look for shared solutions? Migration is a local as well as a global subject all by itself. A number of ICOM international committees, mainly the specialty committees that comprise city museums and regional museums, have been working on this phenomenon for a while now. Yet, the depth of the refugee crisis challenging Europe today may require more innovative solutions. As a colleague once described so well, the epistemology of ignorance allows us to not know, to unknow the increasing scale of displacement of humans from their homes, hometowns, homelands that is bound to explode in the coming period, not only because of war or poverty, but also because of climate change that has already started to manifest itself. Inclusion is central to the effectiveness and sustainability of museums and this inclusive approach would have to reach out to the victims and prospective or necessary hosts and beyond them to climate change experts, economists of say the OECD, human rights activists, to name only a few NGOs or stakeholders. We cannot afford to not know these. This is the kind of responsibility we take as individual museum professionals and as institutions, the duty to intervene in the life of our neighborhood, of our city in the context of sustainable develop development and social coexistence. This is where we, as civil societal organizations, look for ways of participatory democracy beyond representative democracy, allowing ourselves to disagree and diversify, not discrediting criticism or encouraging polarization. At this point, we talk about the responsibility of the museum to be transparent towards the various communities inside and outside. Yet, decolonizing one's mind is as difficult as decolonizing the museum, both of which have to come to terms not only with colonialism and imperialism of the past, but also nationalism, Eurocentrism, and class contempt of the present. Colonial heritage is not a topic of my talk, but I'm glad it is tackled by fellow speakers in the course of the symposium. Anyway, this is probably the kind of conference that Martin Roth would want to see where, quoting him, different museum traditions could come together to share constructive visions of the future. 